good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, live from a very stormy Toronto, uh, this is IFA's Global Cafe. My name is Bruna Swartz, Director of Communications at the International Federation on Aging. And it is my pleasure to host today's session, which is very special. Uh, please be reminded that this session is being recorded. It's also being live streamed through our Facebook channel. You will find the recordings uh, available later in our webpage in the upcoming year. And if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to post them in the chat function along the bottom of the screen. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Jane Barrett for a great conversation with Mr. Greg Shaw. Jane, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, Bruna, and, and welcome. And thank you all for being with us um, on this Friday, the Friday before we, we um, depart for some you know, holiday break. Um, you know, the title of today's session is 2022 Retrospective. And our guest today is Mr. Greg Shaw. And what I wanted to do in talking with Greg this morning is really to reflect a little bit about, you know, his work history and how things have changed across the last 20 years since he joined the International Federation on Aging. So just to give you some context, Greg has a science and health administration background and is currently the director of international corporate relations for the IFA. But prior to joining the IFA, he held senior management positions within the Australian government in the Department of Health and Aging. And uh, Greg, you've held you know, many positions you know, in Canada and also around the world with respect to older people. So welcome to this, our final Global Cafe for 2022. You know, I would like to start and talk with you about your work with Indigenous peoples in Australia some 20 years ago. What we know now in Australia and consistent with um, the Canadian Inuits and also Maori peoples in New Zealand is the average life expectancy is between six and eight years less than white Australians. So I just wanted you to comment on your work with Indigenous peoples and are you surprised that the average life expectancy is still, you know, some seven or eight years less? Um, thank you, Jane, and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. It really is a, an honour to be um, speaking at the last Global Cafe for the IFA for 2022. Um, many of you know me. But uh, probably what you don't know is that I never started out in healthcare. I never started looking at the issues of older people. I was uh, originally a surveyor. But uh, in my early surveying days, I spent many months living in Indigenous communities in the remote parts of Australia, doing what was called as constructed surveys, so mapping um, all the communities. I became very Friendly and knowing of the Indigenous communities that I worked with, I was considered a brother in many cases to many of the elders and the seniors in those communities. And it was through that those relationships that uh, the Department of Health and Ageing, when they were looking at wanting to develop services for Indigenous people, um, asked me if, if I would provide some support and guidance to them in how we can develop aged care services in remote parts of Australia. Um, back when I started, and that was in 1974, so it was a long time ago, um, certainly the life expectancy differences was probably more likely 15 years, Jane. So there has been improvements over the last 30 or 40, 35 years, but the improvements haven't been matched, uh, don't match the average life expectancy of the broader populations in those communities. So uh, all Indigenous communities are facing similar issues around water, uh, sanitation, housing, accommodation, um, and even the issues around employment and social protection. So it's not surprising that they haven't caught up in terms of life expectancy. You work for government though. Um, you know, you were a senior government officer. So, you know, how, how can we, putting your government hat on, what could we do today to influence government in terms of not only their sustained investment, but really working with Indigenous elders? What are the barriers, you know, to, um, to changing, you know, what we're dealing with now? 
Um, the barriers historically, Jane, have been that um, governments impose um, services, programs, housing, design on Indigenous communities. They don't actually engage enough with those communities to develop those services within their own culture and own design work. I remember when I was working with Indigenous communities, part of, part of the mandate that I said to government that we needed to do was, is I need to sit down with communities to actually get them to design services. They need to design what the premises or the facilities would look like. We need to look at how we can engage those communities in terms of contracts with um, the builders of facilities that a percentage of that uh, funding needed to go towards employing local people as part of the construction process of those services. So by, and I can remember at a place called uh, Guadinado in Fitzroy Crossing uh, in Western Australia, um, taking an architect to sit down with around 15 tribal elders. And he had cardboard boxes basically um, sitting on the red dirt in the outback of Australia, talking to the Indigenous communities about what should the facility look like? How do we build a facility that's going to be culturally appropriate and meet the cultural norms of your community, particularly around death and dying? Because in Indigenous communities in Australia, if someone died in their home, there would be a process where they would vacate that home before they would do a smoking ritual to actually um, get some spirits gone where the person would be, people would be able to live in that facility again. We, we work through those processes, work through the processes with the architect, looking at how the facility would be built and then engaging with community about the construction and having them involved in the construction process. So there was a real ownership of the facility, the service. And it was interesting for me because um, while I wasn't involved in the development of housing in some remote communities, housing was imposed on communities. So the design of housing was, in many cases, a standard house that you could have seen in Perth in Western Australia. Um, and there was always damage to those houses. They could, the communities had no engagement or involvement in the construction. They weren't part of the process and the planning. Um, and generally, there was lots of vandalism and um, damage to those buildings in those communities by generally younger people in the community. But what we found by engaging the older people in the community themselves and then being engaged in the construction was the um, damage Gradinado, I think, had one fl uh, torn flywire screen on a window um, in the construction process because the, only, the community took ownership. They took pride in that facility because they knew it was going to serve their tribal elders in that community from not only the immediate region, but regions far away where people had been moved to long-term care facilities. So it's how does government engage with community to actually ensure that they have some ownership of what's being put in place for them. And whether it's at, at construction or whether it's a service being designed to meet their needs, they need to have ownership. And unfortunately, I don't think governments have learnt a lot in the last 30 years. They still, to a degree, impose services and programs on older people. So Greg, I'm going to continue the, the conversation around long-term care. And you know a lot about the systems in Australia, and I would still say that Australia has a pretty solid aged care system that's, uh, you know, there's legislation, there's matched funding, etc. You know, in the last five years, there was a Royal Commission, and that Royal Commission made um, many, many recommendations. And for those who are not aware, um, just December, I think it was the 14th of um, December, the five-star rating review commenced. And I just would like your perspective about to what degree is um, rating reviews and um, the, the star value placed on facilities. So, for example, there are four categories, you know, that a facility is rated by, and they are compliance, 
the residents' experience, staff and quality measures. So what are your thoughts about, you know, the degree to which this is helpful or not, you know, to the consumers? Um, Jane, I don't think it's helpful to a large degree, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, the old system, uh, which I was a part of, there was 48 standards which services uh, were measured against, and you complied or you didn't comply, and you had a rating out of 48. So we've gone from a 48 uh, measure to a five-star measure. So generally, um, if organisations have met 40 of the 48 standards, um, there was generally a, a pass, um, compliant, it was much more detailed. But with a five-star rating, you're actually reducing technically 48 or 50 standards down to five. So it's one in one for every five. So it's going to be pretty hard for any organization to meet a five-star rating because it's um, because staffing comes into the component around five-star rating services. And we know that um, long-term care has all has been underfunded globally uh, by government. Um, the restrictions, not the restrictions, but the dilemma for service providers is how do we actually manage within the confines of the money that we've provided and the money we receive from residents. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there hasn't been enough staff in long-term care to provide a really quality service. And I don't care what country it is. So we've got, we've got homes now which are being rated as three-star, which previously might have had a 42 or a 43 rating um, under the old standards, and which is pretty good. Um, and people could see much more detail about those standards. I think as the five-star rating services only just come in, there's going to be some teething processes that they're going to go have to go through. And I think for some service providers, which may have been classified as one of the best homes um, or got awards for being one of the best homes under different models of or um, services of excellence, um, are now finding themselves only with two stars or three stars. And I think you referred to a um, home when we were having a discussion earlier today that um, had received only two stars, yet it won a major award um, for the quality of service that it provided. So I think it's a little bit misguiding um, for consumers. Um, Greg, perhaps you could just, look, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, and uh, I know that star ratings on hotels don't necessarily reflect what you're going to have. So I worry that, you know, we're not going to get you know, an accurate picture. But for those that may not know the Australian system, can you just describe what a standard residential facility would look like in terms of, you know, bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera? What would a standard um, facility look like when you walked into it? You know, I'd go back to 1986, so a long time ago when I was in residential care. Back then, I wouldn't approve plans for a residential care home or a long-term care home if it didn't have single bathrooms for every single room in that facility. The only time, and they were all single rooms, no double rooms. The only time you'd have a double room is for a husband and wife sharing a room, but they would always have an ensuite bathroom. You know, um, my mother was in a long-term care facility for five years with, or seven years with dementia, but she had a single room. There was a tracking system to be able to move her from her bed into the bathroom because her mobility was very, very limited. Um, she could be showered, washed, changed, and treated with much dignity. Yet we see countries like Canada, uh, which still um, under the um, current building codes are still building homes with um, multiple rooms, um, shared rooms, with shared bathroom facilities or shared um, washroom facilities. So you might have a one washroom, which consists of a toilet and a, a wash basin um, for two residence rooms, uh, which is an adjoining uh, wash space. Yet the standard here in Canada, in Ontario, is 
one bathroom per 23 or 25 residents. And I've always wondered, how can you manage dignity, privacy, and infection control when, you've, when you're having 20 odd residents sharing a washroom or a bathroom and trying to manage or coordinate the timing when people would have their shower or bath in those facilities. So I can't understand why we still build facilities that don't have single rooms en suite for every single resident of a home. I know I don't want to go into a home where I'm sharing a washroom with someone else and I'm wheeled down a corridor um, to a bathroom where I'm showered by others and then back to my room. It's just, it's just a, it's a strange situation. And I, I always feel that when I hear about the discussions that they had in Canada, you know, the discussions that we had in the Australian government 30 odd years ago. So why do we still have these outdated standards where you're actually not respecting the privacy and dignity of residents in long-term care? So Greg, I just want to move on to the pandemic and link it back to long-term care because you know the pandemic really exposed what we that many of us already knew, you know, about um, facilities. And certainly many in many countries, you know, the infection control and the lack of staff and you know congregate living really resulted in um, brutal number of deaths. Um, you know, Canada, for example, I'm sure, you know, there were 80% of those that died were in long-term care facilities. Um, in the sectors that we talk in every day, they see COVID as an opportunity for system change. Do you think that there is an opportunity for system change in many countries in the world, including Canada? Because I know Dr. Samir Sinar has, has developed, uh, is, is working on some national guidelines. You know, do you feel hopeful for the future? I would like to say I do feel hopeful, but um, governments run on four-year cycles and it's hard to get governments committing to something which is long-term. So we're talking about probably a 10-year strategy to make the structural and reforms uh, uh, reforms that are needed to actually ensure that services are built, developed, programs are in place which are going to respect um, older people. I don't think I will see it in my working career. I don't think I will see the changes that are needed in Canada um, in my working career um, at the ISA. I think there are countries which are recognising the opportunities for the need for structural reform coming out of COVID-19. Um, and I think some governments, particularly those where there is national standards or national programs and not a piecemeal like we have in Canada where provincial governments manage the long-term care systems, that there is opportunity for change. But while we in Canada have this system of individual provinces developing their own programs, their own services, their own design guidelines, I think it's problematic. I don't think we'll see the change that really is needed um, in a four-year, five-year, or even 10-year. Um, yeah, good, good to know that you're optimistic today. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> Greg's optimism. I'm yeah. just, you know, there are two people that have responded to questions around this area. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask Cynthia Stewart to come forward mm -hmm. and also Cathy Pecora Fuller. Cathy, it's very early where you are, but Cynthia... Please ask your questions and then we'll go to Kathy. Okay. Well, it really struck me, Greg, when you were talking about the indigenous of, of Australia and Canada, how similar in terms of the United States with our Native Americans it is. And you kind of alluded with the long-term care system to what structural problems are. But given your travels everywhere, do you, do you see any pockets or any sectors of services that are truly listening to older persons, regardless of indigenous or not, um, because I don't honestly, I don't, I don't think they are, or they give lip service to listening. Um, but I just wondered who, if if you've come across any, or uh, if there are any sectors you do think 
um, might be ahead of the game? Um, Cynthia, thank you for the question. And look, I think there are places which are ahead of the game. And I think of some of the Scandinavian countries, which uh, develop, you know, still putting in long-term care, but the focus very much is around home-based care services um, with social contracts for older people. They're looking at rehabilitation more than maintenance, basic maintenance and support. They're actually looking at how they can improve function of people. Um, so there's there's been a shift in, in some of those, particularly Scandinavian countries, and I think of Denmark particularly, which hadn't built long-term care facilities for over 20 years, but has only just recently um, done it again. But I think they engage with older people much more um, than many other countries like the United States and like Canada, uh, and to a, to a degree, even you know, to Australia as well. Um, and I, I think your point is well taken, Greg, because in Denmark, we have Dane Age, a member of IFA with over 800,000 members. And so they are a very strong advocate and influencer with the government. So I think that there's that bottom up approach. I'd like to go to um, Cathy and then also to Tom McCormack. So Cathy. I know one of the kind of hot topics that is getting some traction now is uh, how to reconceptualize the delivery of primary care uh, using interprofessional teams which is very exciting, but I'm, I've been kind of noticing that age is not one of the domains that I have seen coming up in those discussions. So there are this idea of interprofessional teams. It seems like given that there's um, an aging population, I mean, way before people get to long-term care, I think the biggest chance is to actually start to get things right when people are in middle age where they have an opportunity to, to have a health promoting approach in their healthcare for self-management, for remaining active, uh, all of these things which actually get set out when people are um, beginning to age. And then to maintain that and to have better home care. And long-term care is kind of almost too late uh, to start looking for solutions there if you haven't set up the, the preliminaries over the life course. Maybe it's the developmental psychologist in me. But, um, you know, I, I, I think I, what I really like about IFA is this idea that aging isn't just at some age, it's over the life course. So, I mean, is that is that actually something a government could get its head around? Is that, um, you know, maybe, maybe they would engage better and have more uh, informed uh, citizens who could look after their own aging and, and all of that if they actually kind of looked at the whole spectrum and not just piecemeal at this is long-term care and this is primary care, but it, it's actually a package and, and there has to be the, the stream right all the way through the system. Um, Kathy, thank you for that, those comments and the, and the question. Interdisciplinary teams are essential if we're going to really address the issues impacting older people. Um, and those interdisciplinary teams need to be within residential care facilities as well. You know, I reflect on um, one of the services that I visited in Hong Kong, and one of their biggest units in that particular uh, facility was a rehabilitation unit. Um, how many homes have a very big rehabilitation unit to improve function of older people? And I think um, they don't. The other issue I think is that Long-term care generally is seen as a medical issue. It's, a, it's not an aging issue. So if we have programs and services being developed on a medical model, which is actually disease focused and not wellness focused, we're going to be staying in the same place we are today uh, for many years to come. When you consider 
the amount of funds that governments spend on interventions around health promotion and health prevention, which is a very, very small percentage of uh, GDP. Um, when there's a health crisis, what programs get cut by government, by the health departments which run aged care? It's always long-term care or those ancillary services because they're focusing on primary health care and disease focus. So somehow, you know, I look, as much as I still criticise some of the things that happened in Australia, Australia took ageing out of health and actually had a minister for ageing. So it made a huge difference to a large degree in looking at um, if there were issues around the health portfolio or health budget, uh, money couldn't be taken out of the aged care system. So there was still emphasis around health promotion and health prevention. Governments need to be looking at health promotion, health prevention much earlier. They need to be doing it for a longer period of time and recognise they're not going to see returns on those investments for probably 10 to 12 years to the future. And that's the problem we have by government elections happening every four years. Okay. And uh, thank you, Cathy. And just to acknowledge your work in, in hearing and hearing in later life and the importance of actually having hearing assessments with an integrated approach. And uh, so we continue to, to push that. Jane, Jane I'd, I'd just like to make one further comment. I mean, when I think about hearing, vision, part of the assessment process of people going into long-term care, how many older people as part of the intake into that home have a hearing assessment? How many people have a vision assessment? Um, it's not part of the standard practice. And those things need to be, we need to be thinking outside of the silos that we work in and think about the whole health of an individual, whether it's at home or in community. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, functionally, communication and mobility, navigation, you, you can't do that without your senses. No. And cognitively, you, you, where the world is confusing enough, mm -hmm. even if you get good quality inputs, let alone if you get bad quality inputs, yeah. And I, I think, you know, even just starting at the at the bottom of the whole picture, you know, the tragedy is even the people who have had vision care and hearing care before they get into long term care, you know, what happens? All the glasses wind up in a basket on the nurse's desk and nobody knows which ones belong to whom. Yeah. And and people are told to not bring their hearing aids because they'll just get lost. And uh, so basically people are sentenced to sensory deprivation. This is some kind of a nightmare science fiction movie that is just, you know, like, well, let's just take away your wheelchair. You know, that they don't do, um, but they do put people in wheelchairs who could actually uh, walk independently if they were supported. Yeah. So basically, people are, uh, you know, uh, it's not just that they aren't screened, it's whatever they've been doing before is just taken away from them. I mean, it really is criminal. Anyway, yeah, uh, lots it's, to do. Yeah, lots to do. But it's also interesting, Kathy, that there are different systems that are incentivized. For example, many governments incentivize dependency. So the more dependent you are, the more money. Whereas in Hong Kong, in many systems, it's reversed. So if you're able to maintain a person's function and independence, then they get more money. So much to do. Okay, let's move on to Margaret and then uh, Bill Smith. Margaret? Great. Hi, good morning, everyone. And, and thank you, IFA, for all that you do for older persons. It's always great to be on these calls. Um, my question to Greg is um, it's sort of taking the two issues we've talked about, Indigenous people and um, the question of aging and ageism. I want to ask Greg if he had some ideas on how we can start to work more closely with some of the Indigenous communities here in Canada. It's something we have not we haven't really organized ourselves as older uh, aging organizations, but I think we do need to think about how to, to cross jurisdictions and to and to pull some people into conversation. So I just want to get some thoughts on that from Greg. 
working with indigenous communities is a, is it's a different difficult portfolio. Um, you know, I was a white fellow working in indigenous communities, and some people from indigenous backgrounds would say that Greg Shaw can't work with indigenous communities because he's not Aboriginal. Yet, I was probably more Aboriginal than some of those people which were making those comments because I'd lived with those communities uh, for months on end and years on end in, in, in many cases. It's, it's actually developing relationships um, and taking politics out of the scenario. And I would have been loved to have been working with Indigenous communities here in Canada, but it's the politics that come into play which prevent people that may, may know something on how to work with Indigenous communities to develop programs and services. Um, it's government that's the barrier in many cases. But I think there is a real role for our sectors to be working much more with Indigenous communities if that's possible. Um, but one would probably argue if the if um, IFA didn't have a Indigenous person in its ranks, how can they work with one of the communities in the remote north? I mean, it's it's a it's a difficult scenario, but I think it's not something that can't be overcome. I think I think if you if we talk to the older people in remote communities, they would probably and this is the experience that I had. Um, they would say, it doesn't matter whether we're white, brindle or black, we're, we're the same, we're people, we're human beings. We don't want for anything that's different than what each of us want for. It's how do we actually um, work together to get those services in place. And I think if we work with elders in communities, they would probably be saying exactly the same thing as what the Indigenous communities in Australia said to me. You know, we I think, are, Greg, yeah. I think, Greg, what you've said there is also about trust and yeah. trust takes a long time to develop and, uh, and it's not one year, two years, it's a process. I just also want to acknowledge Margaret Gillis and Kieran Rabaru, you know, who are co-chairing the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism. Um, Margaret, 2023 is going to be a very big year for all of us and it will need all hands on deck to actually ensure that this campaign gets up and running and is sustained you know, in years to come. So thank you very much for your leadership. And perhaps in the new year, you could come on and talk with us about um, your journey, because you've also been many years in government and what led you to what you're doing now. So I'm going to reach out and I'm going to book you. Um, so Dr. Bill Smith, Bill. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for all that you do at IFA. Uh, sorting out the UN is such an easy task, and you are masterful in doing it. Uh, there have been some improvements in long-term care, and I want to just focus for a second on the greenhouse model, but it, it really is a sample of smaller residential types of housing for people with just different levels of disability, some dementia, some uh, cognitive issues, some physical issues. But that's one model and it works in different areas. It usually doesn't work in urban areas, uh, but it is a, an attempt to get away from the very large facilities, which are hugely expensive. But unless you have the, the volume, you don't have enough revenue coming in to service it. But in reality, we don't have enough staff to really come into our facilities or into our home and community-based services. Uh, and we have demonized the administration of our long-term care facilities. Basically, we've uh, put them all into one kettle and they're all evil and they're all thieves, et cetera. And we can't do the broad brush like that with, with our facilities. Many of the not-for-profits usually aim toward having quality as compared to the profit motive of having it as a business and making a surplus at the end of the year. Uh, and I have nothing against business, but older people are not about business. We need to somehow motivate our employees to see the value in the work that they're doing and we need to recognize them. And that has not become a governmental issue yet. We just simply are underfunding these uh, organizations. 
and, and in, even in home and community-based services. Our own organization goes back to 1852. And we started off as home and community-based. And then in 68, we became a large nursing home provider, long-term care rehab provider. Now we are out of the business because we looked at our tea leaves and, and basically said, we will be bankrupt if we continue down this road. So now we don't fight with managed care, Medicaid, managed, uh, private pay, any of the insurances, but we're becoming more like a foundation trying to support innovative not-for-profit initiatives to keep older people living at home. Frankly, when I talk to older people, that's where they want to be. A good example of this is Helen Hamlin, who many of you know, turned 100 years old just recently. And in the last week, I received a notice from, and some of you will have too, a notice where, from her daughter where Helen has returned to her apartment with a live-in staff person. Now, that's fine if you have the resources to do that, but most people do not have those resources. So it becomes a situation of funding, it comes to the situation of priorities, education. The multidisciplinary approach is critical. But uh, you know, when you look at how we evaluate good quality facilities, it's dismal what's going on. Now I've ranted long enough. Thank you for the time. Dr. Yeah. Smith, oh, sorry, Jane. No, no, Greg, you, you respond. Go ahead. Dr. Smith, it's always nice to, uh, hear you talking about um, your experiences because they're lived experiences just like all of us have in many cases. Um, governments don't provide enough funding to long-term care homes um, to provide adequate resources, staffing levels, quality of care in long-term care until governments start recognising they need to increase funding so that we can actually pay people a decent wage for the jobs that they do in long-term care, we're going to be talking about this issue, this issue for years to come. If we can get governments to recognise that the service that the carers are provide, care workers are providing and nurses in long-term care um, are valuable, they're important, uh, we need the government to be responding with money and it's not coming until such time as we can actually pay people a decent wage for the work that they do, which can be very rewarding. And we need to be able to articulate why it's rewarding to people to be caring for older people. Uh, we're going to be in the same situation we are today. So I just hope that governments start seeing and making changes to actually recompense long-term care providers and community care providers with adequate funding so that they can actually pay people a decent wage. That's, that's very important, well, well said, Greg. Uh, I, I think the other thing that's hit me personally is with COVID, we restricted the visitation, the movements, et cetera. And having lost my wife a couple of years ago, it's become a situation of where I think of, okay, where am I going to end up? And I think that's a dilemma for us because I'm not going into a facility that locks down during major infections or COVID issues or things of that nature. And there will be more of that. I need to have my independence. So what does that mean? And I don't know what it means yet. I don't know where I'm gonna go, but you, know, you, you wanna hope that there's a system in place to support some of the home-based community services that are so critical. And frankly, that's where the seniors wanna be. Yeah, a, perhaps perhaps we need to uh, create a, a commune bill <laughs> in our seventies and eighties. It um, sounds good to me. <laughs> um, look, I just want to acknowledge Small. Small is with us every Friday, and he's inevit inevitably the first person that puts a question in the box. So thank you, Small, for always being with us. Greg, it really speaks to Small's question speaks to the future. You know, what have we learned in 2022? You know, what are the projects that have been central to our work and the work of others? And what can we hope for in 2023? So I think that's a great entree into your thoughts that were reflective of our two day meeting in Zagreb, but also, you know, what we're going to be doing with others going forward. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question, Small, and thanks, Jane. Look, no one could have even thought that at the beginning of 2019, the extent of the pandemic's impact on the economy, lives and livelihood of older people across the globe. It is only now that we're becoming clear with murmurings of recessions, increasing costs of living, impact of those who are mostly socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged that are often older people. Moving forward, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about where, where we've been in 2022. And I think of the work that the IFA has been doing in 2022, which will culminate in many cases to some significant reports, which hopefully will influence policy and shift policy um, in 2023. You know, our work at the United Nations, whether it's the UN General Assembly, Commission for Social Development, and thank you, Cynthia, for the work that you do, Commission on the Status of Women, high-level political forum, or even the open-ended working group. Um, and Margaret, you're driving that, Margaret Gillis, um, from, from the Canadian perspective. Yeah, our work with the World Health Organization, whether it's the Executive Board, the World Health Assembly, the Clinical Consortium of Health and Aging, the Consortium for Metrics, Evidence and Healthy Aging, Vaccine Safety Net. You know, our work with WHO has really been about how do we actually bring some of the silos that are within WHO to actually start talking together with the civil society uh, community. And I think we've achieved that to a, to a large degree. So I think we will see things happening within WHO where there's a much more robust discussion across some of those silos. Um, and that's certainly reflected in our triennial plan with WHO, whether it's long-term care strategy for integrated older people, the 2030 strategy on priority four, which is a life, life course and integrated approach, behavioral and social drivers, the Rehabilitation Alliance. So we're now part of a Rehabilitation Alliance within WHO, which we haven't been in the past. And really the focus around WHO hearing and vision. I think they're things that really our work with WHO will actually impact policy at government levels, whether it's national or local into the future. Um, a, qu a question, I'll stop you, take a breath. Yeah, okay. I, I, I just want to come back to you because IFA has been and will be in the future criticised for our focus on health. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, for example, we have a focus on vision health, oral health, um, vaccination. So can you actually take us from our focus on that and how it impacts economy? Um, Jane, we work on, as you know, you could probably articulate better than I can. Um, we're always coming from the context, the, the stance of um, improving function of people. So our, if we know that there's vision health programs are in place around older people, because we know vision impacts function, um, in, case, in some cases, uh, cognition, how do we actually ensure that vision health programs are in place to actually maximize function of individuals. Similarly with hearing, similarly with vaccination, because we know that if people and, and uh, groups that have uh, comorbid conditions are vaccinated, the, the likelihood of maintaining function is much more improved. And we know that someone that um, comes down with pneumonia, a pneumococcal is hospitalized, the likelihood of them getting back to 100% of the function that they had prior to that um, is very unlikely. So if we actually have these programs in place that actually focus on vaccines, it's all about maintaining and improving function of older people. But perhaps you might want to make a couple of comments about that. Oh, look, I, I think... Um... I, I think it's, I, I think you've captured it very well. Um, I think the way that I look at it and we look at it is that, you know, if we can ensure that there is adequate screening, management and treatment for people with um, vision complications from diabetic, from diabetes, for example, 
then that is actually going to reduce the burden on our healthcare system and, and also on our long-term care system. So, you know, I think that it's important that we actually uh, follow the pathway um, to understanding the impact of health on the, 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 the systems. Um, I think one of the difficulties is how do we speak to the issues of social protection and economic security, you know, in this world? And I think that's one area that, you know, the way that we do that is by supporting organisations such as Help Age International. So, Cathy, Pecora Fuller, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to quickly say I, I think this siloed, you know, whether it's body parts or professions, you know, integration and and kind of the whole person has to, it's, it's exciting that we actually are going somewhere now. And, yep. you know, as a, as a researcher, I, I'm really happy because now we're, my colleagues and I who do vision, hearing, mobility, cognition, and integrating it all. And now we are writing chapters, you know, for geriatric textbooks, we're writing a chapter for the American Psychological Association. And it's like, no, all the old books that had different chapters are wrong. Yeah. So we want to put our chapters together and talk about how it all works together for functioning. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, science has been too siloed as well as practice. Mm. Um, so I, I, I'm very, I'm very hopeful about that. Um, yeah, yeah, so exactly. I think somehow, somehow the world is going to change that way. And I have had the chance recently to hear uh, from the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences meetings, yes. some brilliant talks, you know, by the Minister of Health federally and also provincially here in BC about the uh, handshake between economy and health. Yes. Uh, so I, I do think we could all be on the same page. <laughs> yes, look, I, I'm sure we are. I think my point was this is not an easy area to work in. You know, building bridges across sectors and disciplines takes time. And it certainly makes sense to the IFA and we can connect the dots. But it's about what's the narrative that we need to create to convince, you know, government, but also convince you know, our colleagues. I'm just going to go to David Richardson for his comment and question, David. Thank you, Jane. Um, well, there's been a couple of questions, I suppose. But the first, I, I'm, uh, I, I want to just say by way of a, a preface, uh, our community may be in a position to have a new long-term care facility built to replace a very antiquated uh, uh, building and so on. And uh, I've been trying to get some dialogue going at the community level about um, uh, I guess not settling simply for a building that meets the code, but to try to 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 sort of leap ahead in 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 the concept of long term care. But it's hard to find uh, sort of where the motivation lies to do better than than the basic sort of level of of care and des and building design, because there's no market motivation. And if you're dealing with a for profit company, it's very difficult to find. Uh, a nerve to press that will actually that, that will actually get a reaction, and the municipality tends to see people. Uh, I don't I don't mean just my municipality, but all municipalities tend to see people in long term care as being somehow wards of the province. You know, it, it, they don't feel as much like a, a part of the community as a, an older adult living uh, independently or on in their own home. And so it's hard to find a motivation uh, to, as I say, to sort of go beyond the basics. But the uh, the the other sort of I suppose related question is um, the, the the stratification in the health in the long term care system in Ontario, where you have uh, for profit companies, for profit uh, individual uh, facilities, for profit corporate uh, facilities, non profit corporate facilities, and non profit individual facilities, and then the municipal and We've never allowed that. Uh, we've always resisted in Canada allowing that kind of stratification of the healthcare system, uh, where and, and, and but we've allowed it to develop in the long-term care system. And you don't really have a choice uh, when you reach that point of 
possibly probably having to go into a long-term care facility, whether you get sort of the high performing municipal uh, 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 facility, uh, building or home, or whether you get a, a, a for-profit corporate home. Uh, and I'm just wondering why, how we've allowed that to happen and whether there's any way to reverse that, uh, I guess, and to marry the two up, who do you motivate? How do you motivate uh, a, a system that consists of all of these different players playing <laughs> In the, in the game, how do you find a place to 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 get the motivation to make the change? Uh, I guess in a long winded way, that's my question. <laughs> David, yeah, it's a great question, Greg. David, um, you've hit the nail on the head really well to a large degree, particularly in the context of Canada. But you know, I think of I've never differentiated between the private for profit sector or the not for profit sector, because I would argue that unless you can actually make a surplus, you, you can't operate a facility. But it comes back to the minimum, the standards in terms of design um, and what is expected of a long term care facility and those standards need to be improved here in Canada. Um, so that and the other thing is that there shouldn't be a difference between the amount of funding that a long-term care facility, whether it's private for profit or not for profit, receives from the government. They should be all treated the same. I know that was the system that we operated in Australia, that they received the same money. Um, but they couldn't, they could, whether it was private for profit or not for profit, they could only charge exactly the same amount of fees to residents. And that's different here in Canada. It varies a lot. Um, and then for individuals that were socially disadvantaged, depending on the location of those homes, you would, you would know that 25% of older people in that, that region were financially disadvantaged. So 25% of the beds needed to be allocated towards financially disadvantaged people. And that doesn't happen here. So there is a real, that tr private profits and not-for-profits are treated very differently. And until such time as we can actually streamline them to bring them back to the same page, we're going to still have the issues that we have today. But I really um, understand the dilemma that you're having, David, in trying to develop a program or a, a facility which is beyond what the minimum standards are here in Ontario. I would like to think that you know every resident has their own individual room, that they have their own bathroom and shower space and toilet space um, that there's good communal living areas and there's opportunities uh, for residents or people to actually be involved in the development and design of those facilities. One of the other difficulties is that no one ever expects to go into long-term care. So when you're talking about how getting community engagement and community involvement, people may well be happy to talk, but they never see themselves as going into long-term care and it's until such time as a, there's a crisis in the family that those types of services are needed. But um, IFA and I would be happy to continue discussions with you, David, as we move forward. I will never get used to Zoom. Um, Greg, as we move towards uh, closing this, our final session for 2022, I'm going to ask you to just uh, think about three of the key messages that you want to convey to us today so that I can then go forward, so I'm thinking forward into the 6th of January, 2023, when we will have our first conversation. This is a very important conversation. And uh, oddly enough, it actually links to the conversation that we've had today. We will have the pleasure of talking with Pat Sparrow, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Council of the Aging in Australia. COTA Australia is the most influential NGO in Australia when it comes to aged care. Pat was involved with the Royal Commission some years ago. So this is her bread and butter. And now she's leading one of the most powerful NGOs in Australia and arguably in the world. So join with us and talk with Pat. The title of it is Post a Royal Commission the future of aged care in Australia. So we'll come back together on the 6th of January at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before I hand the floor to you, Greg, I want to personally thank the IFA team. Um, 
you don't often see us all on the screen and perhaps we need to in January show, show you the team. But I can tell you it is with great pride and it's an honour to work with each and every one of these individuals who inspire me, who are dedicated and are committed not only to the IFA, but to improving the lives of older people around the world. So I thank all of the IFA team who are with us today. I also want to acknowledge the IFA representatives at the United Nation in Geneva, in Vienna, and many of them join every week. Um, thank you, Cynthia Stewart, for your leadership of the IFA, represent, uh, rep, the IFA representatives in New York. It's getting later in the year, isn't it? But also all those that support and encourage the IFA's work, our partners, our colleagues, our funders, our experts. When I came into the job 20 years ago, my philosophy was, if someone asks IFA, can you do this? My immediate response would be, yes, of course, and then work out how we're going to do it. That philosophy continues today for good or bad. You know, we want to be and continue to be an organisation that shares unconditionally. Now is not the time to protect intelligence, interests or views. Now is the time to reach across the aisles and join with others in solid partnerships, walking towards a common agenda that truly will influence and shape policy. And finally, thank you to Bruna, to Luana and to Jasmine, the communication team who um, deliver each and every day, you know, the glue that enables us, the IFA, to advocate with and on behalf of older people. So Greg, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to you on this, our special day, and uh, ask you to deliver key messages to take us out for the year. I wish everybody a safe and happy time with your family and friends and join us next year. So Greg, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Look, my key message is that, you know, I see 2023 as a year of hope and change. And I think where we working together can influence that hope and change that's needed. My other takeaway message is that we need to bring all of these elements together. And I invite you all to the IFA 16th Global Conference which will be taking place in Bangkok, the 27th to the 30th of June next year. If you haven't already seen the website, I encourage you to go. It is ifaconf.ngo. Um, abstracts are open, registrations open, and it really intersects with the decade of healthy aging. WHO will be actively involved. We have five themes attached with the conference around digital technology and practice, older women. We already have a keynote speaker around older women, and that's Denise Eldermia Shearer, for those who, of you who know, may know her. Um, the other themes areas, maintaining improving function, and we've talked a, bit, a little bit about that today, and immunization for all ages. And finally, age-friendly environments, which we can encapsulate all of the work that we do must be age-friendly. And it's not aged-friendly, it's age, which starts at birth. So I thank you all. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And I look forward to seeing you all again next year. So please take care and thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.